Light barely travels further than 200 meters through water, making the deep sea by far the biggest habitat on Earth, and yet it is also the least explored by humans. New discoveries are made with every venture down into the dark, but for now let's just discuss what little knowledge we already have. Lanternfish are the most abundant vertebrates on planet Earth. A family of small fish consisting of around 250 species, it's estimated that their global population could be in the quadrillions. But even with such numbers, the open ocean is not safe with nowhere to hide from predators. That's why lanternfish and many others shelter in the darkness of the twilight zone during daylight hours and rise to the surface at night to feed on plankton. From about 200 meters below the surface, sunlight is faint enough that photosynthesis becomes impossible. There are no plants in the twilight zone, but the many animals here use the limited sunshine to their advantage, while some also create their own light with specialized organs called photophores. Many fish have them just below their eyes, and it's easy to assume that they're used as headlights. However, shining a light in the dark doesn't let you see anywhere near as much as it lets others see you. Light created by animals called bioluminescence has a variety of functions here in the twilight zone, but it is rarely for seeing. Lanternfish have large photophores behind each eye, and their bellies are covered in rows of smaller ones. It's likely that they use the large ones for communication, perhaps to show others where they are, allowing them to stick together in a school, or perhaps is to dictate which way they think the school should swim. No one knows for sure. But we do know that the underside lights are used for a camouflage technique adopted by many Twilight Zone inhabitants called counter-illumination. Given the scarcity of light here, it's very hard to see anything looking across, but look towards the surface and anything swimming above you will be clearly silhouetted against the dim light. Underside photophores can mimic its intensity and cancel out the silhouette that the fish would otherwise be casting. Viperfish are common predators of lanternfish, but due to their slow metabolism, it's not every night that they need to follow their prey towards the surface. They often dive even further into the depths, especially in the tropical regions, as they prefer colder water, but they are most at home in the twilight zone. A typical viper fish only grows to about 30 centimeters long, but with an expandable stomach and jaws that can open incredibly wide, these fish can prey on animals much larger than themselves. They tend to swallow their prey whole, and in doing so their gigantic teeth are not always used as weapons, instead functioning more like prison bars, stopping prey from swimming back out of its jaws once inside. Nevertheless, they are still razor sharp, and the frontal fangs are so long that they do not fit inside its mouth when closed. But even these formidable creatures have predators of their own. Visitors from above, like pelagic sharks, outmatch viperfish by sheer size, and other deep-sea locals like anglerfish and black swallowers have also evolved wide jaws and expandable stomachs. And so hunters can just as easily become hunted if they're not careful. However, viperfish are well adapted to hiding themselves in the twilight zone. On their upper side, their skin is extremely dark, blending them in with the gloomy water below to anything looking down on them. On their undersides are rows of photophores, used for counter-illumination. They have a thin profile making them hard to see head on, and the scaleless skin on their sides is rough, silvery, and highly reflective. This might seem counterintuitive as we use reflective materials to make ourselves easily visible, but due to its uneven structure, viperfish skin scatters the reflection rather than focusing it, making it virtually invisible. Other animals resort to transparency to hide themselves. Hatchet fish, named after their body shape resembling an axe, have transparent tails, in addition to silvery bodies and underbelly photophores. Their large, powerful eyes are pointed upward to search for prey silhouetted above. Barrel eye fish have their eyes situated inside a transparent portion of their heads. This protects the eyes from the stings of passing jellyfish and siphonophores that the fish might accidentally encounter. But it's also theorized that the dome allows more daylight to be directed into the eyes, allowing for even stronger vision. Glass squids are almost completely transparent, with eyes and a single digestive gland being the only opaque body parts in many species. Vampire squid are not transparent, but their skin is red, another common adaptation for camouflage. Water absorbs red light more readily than it does blue, which is what gives the sea its blue colour. Red pigments blend in with the darkness down here, as they absorb other wavelengths of light and there's no red light here to reflect. As a result, most deep sea fish have not evolved to be able to see the colour at all. But the vampire squid has a defensive strategy beyond simply hiding. The underside of its arms are lined with sharp spines, and when startled it will wrap them around its body essentially, but not literally, turning itself inside out and becoming a ball of unappetizing spikes. The continental shelf is the seabed that lies close to shore, less than 1,000 meters from the surface, and many animals here walk rather than swim. Urchins, starfish, and crabs scuttle across the floor in search of food, and down in the deep they grow to extraordinary sizes. Japanese spider crabs can reach a body size of 40 centimeters wide and can measure nearly 4 meters across from the tip of one leg to another. They are the largest crabs in the world, and a good example of deep-sea gigantism. 
the trend for deep sea animals, mainly crustaceans and invertebrates, to be much larger than their shallow water relatives. There are many theories to explain why this happens, but a common one alludes to Kleiber's law, which states that a larger size allows for a more efficient metabolism, which is especially beneficial at the bottom of the sea, where food is extremely rare. Even some fish have learned to walk along the seabed. Deep sea monkfish, also called anglerfish, are ambush predators with specialised pelvic fins that they use as feet. They have an elongated dorsal ray with a photophore at the tip, which hangs above the mouth, flashing to lure prey towards it. Open ocean anglerfish use this same energy-conserving hunting strategy, but many species also have pressure sensors whereby they can detect tiny movements in the nearby water, which is as useful for defence as it is for attack. Some animals don't rely on light at all. The goblin shark can grow to nearly 4 metres long and hunts all kinds of fish, cephalopods and crustaceans near the bed of shallow seas without photophores nor particularly large eyes. It's pink in colour, which serves as camouflage, and its long snout contains many receptors that can detect nearby electric fields, such as those produced by animals. Its jaws are highly extendable, which allows it to snatch up prey without expending the energy of a full-body strike. It's one of the several sharks in the deep sea referred to as a living fossil, as similar species all died out a long time ago and can only be found in fossil records. It indicates that these sharks have not evolved in many millions of years and goes away to explain their strangeness in appearance and behaviour. The frilled shark is another living fossil that dwells in open water at around a thousand metres down. It has six pairs of gill slits, which is a common feature of living fossil sharks, as almost every other shark alive today has five. Originally mistaken for an eel when it was first discovered, its body resembles a snake, not only due to its elongated shape, but also its mouth is situated at the front of its head rather than underneath, which is unlike every other shark species we know of. They get their name from the shape of their gill slits, and that the gills themselves protrude far from them, looking like a frilled collar. They've never been observed hunting, and no stomach contents have been found in any captured individuals, but it's estimated that a large portion of their diet is cephalopods like squid, as their hundreds of small, back-curved teeth are well designed to prevent slippery prey from escaping its jaws. Likewise, there are only estimations for how they are able to hunt fast-swimming squid. One theory is that they coil themselves and strike in a similar motion to a snake, often coiling around rocks or plants when they venture to shallow coastal waters. Another is that they can close their gill slits, which builds up a pressure inside their mouths as they lunge forward, sucking the prey right in. But nothing can be said for certain until the day they're finally observed on the hunt. Venture further out from the shore, and the continental shelf eventually comes to another drop-off called the Continental Slope. The ocean beyond is much deeper and darker. Below 1,000 metres, we enter the Midnight Zone. Light from the surface cannot reach down here at all, and unlike the bustling Twilight Zone, life here becomes ever more sparse as we descend. Dragonfish belong to the Stomidae family, the same as all viperfish, and while they also migrate between a range of depths, some species are well adapted to the darker world of the Midnight Zone. The Pacific Black Dragon hides well here with its extremely black skin. It's up there with some birds of paradise as one of the darkest creatures on the planet. Its skin contains a lot of melanin, a pigment that's also present in human skin, only in the black dragon's case it's very densely packed and arranged into structures that are extremely effective at absorbing photons. As a result, the fish appears more or less completely black even when shining a light on it, making it very difficult to find and very difficult to photograph. The inner lining of its stomach is equally black, ensuring that any prey that luminesces after being swallowed doesn't illuminate the dragonfish and expose it to its own predators. But they can be seen when they choose, as they are absolutely covered in photophores. They have the same underbelly lights as viperfish used for counter-illumination when they rise to the twilight zone, and they have large headlights and luminescent barbels which they use as lures. The black dragonfish, not to be confused with the Pacific black dragon, has lights all along its body that luminesce in a flurry of flashes. No one truly knows the purpose of these bright displays, but it could be to imitate shrimp, which flash in a similar way. Notice how it coils its tail into a shrimp-like shape as it shines. A mimic would not only attract other shrimp to it with the false promise of safety in numbers, but could also attract other predators with the false promise of food, only for the dragonfish to be waiting in ambush. The Stoplight Loose Jaw is another extremely black dragonfish, and is named after some really unusual but highly effective adaptations for living in the Midnight Zone. It gets the name Loose Jaw from its lower jawbone, which is completely exposed, likely for the sake of efficiency, as many predators here can detect nearby movements, and lacking a lower jaw provides less resistance to its bite force. It's therefore likely to kill its prey in a single strike without allowing for any struggling, which reduces unnecessary noise and keeps the fish hidden. It gets the name Stoplight from an adaptation that it shares with the other dragonfish we've seen, which I believe to be one of the most impressive nature has ever shown. They have headlights that can produce red light, and eyes capable of seeing it. Most light down here is blue, as out of all the visible colours, it travels the furthest through water before being absorbed, and is therefore the most effective for attracting both prey and partners here. 
But for the dragonfish, shining their red photophores makes red prey stand out very clearly, red prey that is relatively common down here. Even other dragonfish like the threadfin are red as a form of camouflage. And being some of the only deep sea animals capable of seeing the colour, their prey is completely unaware of its exposure and takes no evasive action when the dragonfish approaches. However, this may not be the dragonfish's usual hunting strategy, as in the twilight zone where prey is more numerous, there are shimmers of sunlight, making their extremely dark skin and red light less effective for stealth. And in the midnight zone where life is more sparse, it's far easier to find food if you attract it to you, rather than attempt to seek it out yourself. Perhaps they use a combination of techniques, but even if red light is never used for hunting, it's still extremely effective for finding a mate, one of the hardest challenges deep sea creatures face. The exact colour of a dragonfish's red light is specific to each species, meaning that their light signals cannot be mimicked even by other types of dragonfish. And like many deep sea fish, they are extremely sexually dimorphic. For example, a female Pacific black dragon can grow to 60 centimetres long, whereas males rarely exceed 8. They also have no teeth, no stomach, they're unable to feed, and only live long enough to mate. This is a highly efficient strategy as it limits competition for resources while maintaining the genetic diversity granted by reproducing sexually. I can't say for certain, but it seems to me that a male not needing to find food likely means it won't be attracted to any lures that are not the specific colour and pattern of a female of the same species, maximising his chances of successfully mating. For a long time it was thought that every animal in the deep sea was a predator, just like the dragonfish, as there are no plants here to thrive on. However, we now know that the food web of the Midnight Zone instead relies on marine snow, a form of dust made from the remains of dead animals, plants, and faecal matter that fall from above. Surprisingly, this is enough to sustain small crustaceans and copepods, which in turn sustain the predators. The gulper eel can grow to just shy of a metre long, and is an active hunter that pursues its prey. While it can form a slim profile by tucking away its jaws, its mouth is absolutely enormous, and fully agape, it can capture prey of almost any size. Although, its usual diet consists of small crustaceans, and the large mouth allows it to sweep through shoals and catch many at once, like a whale charging through krill. Strangely, they have a pinkish-red photophore on the tips of their tails. It seems unlikely to be a lure, as not only is it as far from its mouth as possible, but most animals here cannot even see the emitted colour. It also seems unlikely that it's used to attract a mate, as gulpers have tiny eyes that are practically useless. Males in particular have a strong sense of smell, and it's believed that they find mates by following the scent of female pheromones. It's not yet known whether gulper eels are able to see red light, and many speculate that their photophores emit light that humans are unable to see, and so they only appear pink to us, while still acting as a lure to the natives of the Midnight Zone. The fangtooth is one of the few deep-sea predators that does not use bioluminescence, instead relying on pressure sensors all over its body which can detect nearby movements in the water. It is an aggressive hunter that swims quickly and kills its prey with sharp, transparent fangs that are so big it is unable to fully close its mouth. It can be found from depths as high as the twilight zone all the way down to as deep as 5,000 metres from the surface, making it one of the deepest living fish yet discovered. It only grows to around 15 centimetres long, and yet is one of the deadliest predators down here, only falling prey to far larger creatures like Humboldt squid, which can be just shy of 2 metres in length. They too are aggressive hunters, actively pursuing their prey and catching it with tentacles that are covered in sharp teeth and powerful suckers. They also stick together in large shoals, sometimes over a thousand strong, and rarely dive deeper than the twilight zone, where their prey is most abundant. But even then, there's not always enough to sustain such a large population of predators. Humboldt squid are known to be cannibalistic due to this extreme competition for food, as are giant squid, despite supposedly being solitary hunters. They are the largest of all cephalopods, reaching upwards of 12 meters long, including their tentacles. Colossal squid are the largest by mass, and generally remain in Antarctic regions. Giant squid are much more widespread around the world, and excluding each other, adults have very few natural predators, the most notable being sperm whales, which dive down from the surface to search for them presumably with echolocation. They're often seen covered in distinctive scars from their so-called battles with giant squid, although they have not yet been fully observed on the hunt. Abyssal ecosystems thrive off of biomass that falls from the upper layers of the ocean, and when an animal as large as a sperm whale dies and sinks to the bottom, it can be quite the feeding event for the residents of the deep. The seafloor of the open ocean, called the Abyssal Plain, can be as deep as 6,000 metres from the surface, and once a whale carcass reaches the bottom, it will likely be found by scavengers within a matter of minutes. Abyssal sharks like Sixgill and Sleeper Sharks will bite off large chunks of flesh, and although there's severe competition for a carcass like this, an entire school will likely be sustained for several months from this one meal. Hagfish are a type of jawless fish that are far smaller than the sharks, and lacking a true spinal column, they can weave into tighter gaps between the whale's bones to hack into flesh that the sharks just can't reach. They're one of the only known fish that lacks any true fins, and have been observed tying themselves into knots to increase leverage and ease the tearing of difficult chunks off the whale. 
Smaller still, some species of worm can actually dig into the whale's bones themselves to get at the final scraps of edible matter. Nothing is ever wasted in the deep ocean. While most of the abyssal plain appears almost completely barren, with only the occasional slow-moving scavenger or ambush predator, there are areas that are truly vibrant. Tectonic plates leave fissures in the sea floor as they move apart, called hydrothermal vents, essentially deep sea volcanoes. And just as the land around a volcano is incredibly fertile, hydrothermal vents are home to some incredible ecosystems. Tube worms, shrimps, crabs, eels, and fish can all be found here in huge abundance, because the hot water expelled by these vents is rich in minerals, especially sulfur-containing compounds. It supports cultures of certain bacteria, which use the minerals and heat provided to generate organic materials that, in turn, support the wider community. Hydrothermal vents have even been discovered in the Hadal Zone, the deepest of the ocean's layers, which only encompasses the trenches that drop below the abyssal plain. They can be as deep as 11,000 meters from the surface, and through hydrothermal vents and the tiniest scraps of marine snow that make it this far down, life can flourish here, even that as complex as a fish. Ethereal snailfish are the deepest living fish yet discovered, and they share their harsh habitat with giant crustaceans and copepods. We might have initially assumed that no life could exist in such a place, but it's now believed that life began in the deepest places of the ocean, and could have been caused or at least catalyzed by the existence of hydrothermal vents. It seems there's no place on our planet where life cannot flourish, and there's evidence that vents just like this once existed on Mars. Some people believe that deep sea discoveries like this may be proof that the universe beyond our little world of water may not be so void of life after all. <laughs>